like mine. And uh, mine is a. Uh, <laughs> mine, uh, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. I was in a situation a couple of weeks ago where we were. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it was an interesting situation where a group of our young people had the privilege of being um, in the midst of a study with some postmodernists. And uh, one of the individuals, out of, I think out of a small sense of provocation, uh, decided to um, cast an aspersion on me by uh, linking me with John Calvin. Um, so she, she quoted some Calvin um, under the assumption that I'm a Calvinite, you know. Uh, and I told her, I said, listen, the only thing me and John Calvin would have in common if I were living in his day is that I just got some French blood in me. <laughs> so I know the, uh, I know the uh, idiosyncratic behavior of, of French people. You know, so our French people do have a history. Um, but it was so funny, she thought she would uh, quote Calvin uh, as an aspersion, as an aspersion against a sound hermeneutical approach to biblical interpretation. And I, I just laughed. I said, you know, if I were walking down the street in the days of John Calvin, he wouldn't have paid me two cents <laughs> because I was too dark. And uh, if I came at him the wrong way, I might have ended up being his slave or killed. Um, but we would have still been brothers in Christ. I know that's hard to believe. It's just the fact that all of our roots are rooted in Adam, and they have, they have radical sinful strains to them. That's why I thank God that I'm born first in the, uh, I was born in the 20th century. Secondly, I'm glad that I grew up in the Bay Area versus my hometown, Texas and Louisiana, um, because, you know, it was just much more difficult for folk under the circumstances back in the day. Um, but it was, it's just so funny because I actually am fascinated when people tell me what their background is. I like, I like to know because I see the, the Imago Dei in all peoples. I'm sure you know what Acts says. Um, God has made of one blood all nations of men under heaven. And that right where he spread them abroad because of their high-handed arrogance against the Most High God, wanting to build a tower uh, to heaven to make a name for themselves. He said, no, nah, I'm going to scatter y'all all over planet Earth. And right where you are, you're going to seek me. Right where you are, you're going to seek me. Which by inference means that God bears witness to all men everywhere. If happily, they might seek after God. So I love it when we come together in our studies like we often do. And we're always a diverse group of people here in terms of our background. But our unity is in one person. And that's the Lord Jesus. And that's where we're striving to go in terms of the growth in our character, the growth in our attitude, the growth in our conversation. Um, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's what? Old oh, things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's a prophecy that is uh, determined and destined to be fulfilled to the degree that you and I see our identity in Christ. We can rise above all the divisions when we take Jesus seriously, which is what our class is gonna be about tonight as we deal with the body of Christ gifted sovereignly. So stand with me as we sing this hymn. Then I'm going to have Tim open us in prayer and we're going to get in our study. There's going to be a three-part study, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be messing with your head tonight. So if you didn't get any rest, you're going to fall asleep on me again. That's <laughs> just the way it goes in theology class. So I don't know if you guys, you guys know this one here. It just takes a little while to get it. Uh, our prayer group gets it up. Yield not to temptations for yielding is sin each victory will help you some other to win fight manfully onward dark passion subdue look ever to jesus He'll carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will 
carry you through. Shun evil companions, bad language disdain. God's name hold in reverence, nor take it in vain. Be thoughtful and earnest, kind-hearted and true. Look ever to Jesus, he'll carry you through. Just ask the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you, he will carry you through. To him that overcometh, God giveth a crown. Through faith we will conquer, though often cast down. He who is our Savior, our strength will renew. Look ever to Jesus, he'll carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. Course one more time. Ask the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. You guys believe that? All right, open us in prayer, Tim. Amen. You guys can be seated. Pop your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, this will be the first of a couple of two or three studies in 1 Corinthians 12. We moved out of chapter 11 to 12. Not that we exhausted chapter 11 at all. Um, Saturday night is kind of just a, a good huddle in preparation for service for those of us who are serious about our worship impacting our life. So I really do bless you men for um, taking the opportunities to come out on a Saturday night. Um, I'll encourage you to do something, though, if you decide to come out on Saturday nights. Go somewhere and take a nap before you come into class. Don't, don't be full of activities all during the day and then run up into class and expect, you know, your body to kind of submit to you so that your attention span can be as full as possible. <clears throat> if you mitigate against preparation for the study, it's not going to work. If you are full of a day's activity and you don't get 30 minutes of a power nap or an hour nap, it's not going to work. The Holy Spirit is not going to overcome the food in your body or the drain of the day and you'll lose the benefit. Um, and that's just a strategy that's good at any time. I tell people, if you're going to really benefit from the word of God, you got to prepare before you come. And you got to prepare your heart on your way in. Never assume that you can just come into the presence of God any kind of way and expect to hear his word. I'll, show you what, I'll tell you what you can assume. You can assume a warfare if you don't. You can assume a massive warfare if you don't think about entering into the presence of the study of God's word. Because the last thing the flesh wants to do is to hear from God. The fallen nature is antithetical to God. 
And you have to overcome that in preparation for the word to actually have impact in your life. So if you don't sow to the spirit as a prerequisite to the study by making sure you are rested, by making sure your food is digested, by making sure you have labored to move out of the important issues of that secular day, you're not guaranteed to actually be blessed by the word. How many of you guys agree that there are times when we have come in the wrong way and when we've gone out, fundamentally, there was a small measure of anything that we got, right? So it's really important that you know that, and particularly for thus, those of us who are older men, really understand, you, you hear me actually talk about a holistic approach to the gospel. That's because I'm older now. When you're young, as the proverb says, a young man glories in his strength, but the old man glories in his gray hair. But that's qualified by one statement, if it be found in the way of the Lord. It is not necessarily so that if we have gray hairs that we are wise. So if a man doesn't take the, the, the gray hair and bring them into subjection to God, uh, we cannot associate old age with wisdom automatically as the book of Job has taught us so many times. So what we wanna definitely do is make sure that if we can, Take a power nap, come in a little earlier, pull into the, I do it all the time. I'll do it frequently. If I know I got a labor among you brethren and I've been busy all day and I'm almost always busy all day, even for the speaker, the communicator, he needs that way into the presence of God before you talk, because this is a labor as well. So I want to encourage you in that uh, for future Saturday nights and particularly because it's nighttime. Uh, during the day, it's a little bit easier, but at nighttime, you guys will notice 10 minutes into the study, it'll get you. And the study can be good, but your spirit has not been positioned to actually be able to endure that whole exercise. Because every time we come together, the whole of the class is an exercise. The whole of the class is an exercise. And particularly when you're about to learn new things or things that are off the radar of your immediate interest. You know, we all, if you really love the word of God, we have different sort of agendas theologically. And when you come into a study, you're not gonna necessarily have an immediate affirmation of what's being talked about relative to where you are. That means you gotta shift your interest in order to benefit from what's in front of you in terms of what's being prepared and delivered often. However, what I will say too in, 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 uh, in uh, relationship to what we're talking about, as we prepare to enter into what I consider a really important topic, so I'm just gonna kind of build a framework today around it and we'll press further into it. Um, to the degree that I honor God with modes of behavior, um, preparatory to hearing his word, to that degree, virtually anything that I hear anywhere God will allow aspects of its truth to support what I'm dealing with in terms of the things that's in front of me. If my heart is, is right and I, and I prepare adequately and I don't presume upon you know, his goodness and grace, he will allow me here to hear things out of other topics that will create a direct beeline into what I'm dealing with and augment, affirm, you know, uh, bring emphasis and clarity to what I'm dealing with, and then I'm thankful for that as well. So I do want to encourage you guys in that as we continue to press forward. I want to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. I think I'll read verses 1 through 11, and then we're going to press into our study, and uh, I'm going to see how much we can build a framework around it, and then we're going to tackle it again, the Lord will, in next week, if the young men who are assigned to teach don't usurp my position with their own studies because we have a whole schedule of guys um, studying for the next couple, two or three months, which is really good. And I don't never know when it's my turn until they tell me. Um, see, I don't run everything around here. Here it goes. Uh, verse one of chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away by these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now, there are diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord, and there are diversities of operations, but the same God, which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit therewith. 
For to one is given the spirit by the spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, and to another the gift of uh, healing and, uh, by the same spirit, and to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of spirits, uh, diverse kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh the one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he wills. Thus is the reading of God's word. What we want to do is press into an understanding why it is that um, so eagerly coveted by the body of Christ in so many different ways throughout the centuries. So what I want to first say is the topic is to be understood with regards to the title, the body of Christ gifted sovereignly. You guys see that? So I do want to break this down into three parts so that you can understand the emphasis of our study. The body of Christ. Now, for those of you who were with us last night in our Friday night Bible study, you know I am borrowing from uh, a thematic element in that study last night. How many of you guys were with me last night in the Friday study? So you understood that we were talking about the Corpus Moses and the Corpus Christi, right? Yes. And we were talking about the antithesis and the parallels between the two and how that the enemy, the adversary, would much rather have a Corpus Moses than a Corpus Christi. Right, for his own goals, right? He would much rather a Corpus Moses. But what we're looking at in 1 Corinthians 12 is a Corpus what? Christi. This is the body of Christ. I want you to understand from that standpoint what's happening with regards to this thing called the gifts of the Spirit. When you think about the gifts of the Spirit, what I want you to think about is the Corpus Christi, the body of Christ. And when you think about the body of Christ relative to the gifts of the Spirit, what I want you to think about is, some point, incarnation. So again, you know, you're supposed to be actively listening tonight. That means either you're taking notes or you are a uh, good memorizer because I want to kind of build a composite sketch around what the purpose of the gifts are, of the Spirit are all about so that you and I can understand why it is that people miss, miss why the Spirit of God is given relative to the gifts. The body of Christ, the body of Christ is, is an extension of Jesus Christ incarnate. The body of Christ is an extension of Jesus Christ incarnate. That means that the body of Christ, being an extension of Christ, functions in the world the same way Christ did in his obedience to his Father as the revelation of the invisible God bodily. So as we begin to work towards the gifts of the Spirit, which are, are a very good subject and very necessary for you to know, particularly when you're just engaging people about things like versus the cessation of the gifts. Do the gifts still operate today? Do we still, still have miracles and signs and speaking in tongues and all of that kind of stuff? Those questions are relevant because novices and ignorant people don't necessarily know. What you want to be able to do is help people understand why those gifts were given. Not just that they were or how they were, or how they should be functioned or used, but why they are given. So the first thing I want you to think in your head is this. If, in fact, the body of Christ is the Corpus Christi, then it means that there is a unity between the head and the body that affords the body all of the virtues and the qualities and the benefits of the head. If, in fact, the body of Christ is the body of Christ, by extension, the incarnation of the invisible God in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the very reason there is a Corpus Christi is that we would continue the work that the Son of God did when he was on the earth. Does that make sense? The very reason for which there is a body, do not, do not, from Christ. 
To do so is to create a monstrosity, and it's also to kill the body on the spot, okay? You're immediately killing the body. And now you can abuse that body that's dead. But once you view the body as connected to the head, then as much as we might understand and know who the head is, then we can understand how the body works. Does that make sense? All right, then, so the first category of thought that I want you to be able to comprehend as we study is the body of Christ. A critical doctrine of truth. Is that right? Do we believe in the incarnation? Yeah. Is the incarnation essential to every saving revelation of God? Yeah. Right. And so you're going to see as we open up our verses that the incarnation is really the issue that Paul is dealing with relative to the Corinthians being duped by their co to believe that Jesus came in the flesh. Okay, I'm going to show you that as we work through it. You're going to be dealing with a polemic. But what I do want you to understand is that if we did not believe in the incarnation, we couldn't believe in ourselves. We could not claim 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. We could not uh, claim Galatians 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me in the life that I live in the flesh. I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We couldn't claim that. We couldn't claim Philippians chapter 1, 20 and 21, for me to live as Christ should die as gain. You guys hear what I'm getting at? So if we deny the incarnation of Christ, we deny our own regeneration and renewal an expression of union with the Father through the Son by the Holy Ghost. And so that's critical to understand as we're getting ready to talk about the gifts, we're a unique body in the world that is called by God and qualified by God to do something that only that body can do. No other body in the world can do what the body of Christ can do. No other body in the world can do what the body of Christ can do. No other person in the world could do what Messiah did. No other person in the world could fulfill the assignment that was given to Messiah. Would you agree? No other person. And Messiah was a unique species of theanthropos, God-man. He was the unique species of humanity. That is, he was a second and last Adam of a unique capacity, born, you know, par none, no one equal to him as a man. Is that right? Right. And, and yet that man it was on display for us as a model of what God intended us to be short of the fall of the first taking place. And so in the whole compo composite of the first, the second person, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the revelation of the invisible God, did not he come to bear record of his father? Did he not come to t testify to the truthfulness of the one true and living God? Did he not manifest his father's will in the earth in an incontrovertible way by which the only thing the world could do is receive him or kill him? Is that true? Then by extension, is not the body of Christ called to do the same thing? Manifest the father's will in relationship to the son by the power of the spirit with all of the qualities a unique body doing things in the world that no other body can do. If y'all with me, raise your hand right quick. I just need you to understand where we're about to go. <clears throat> Otherwise, you will fail to benefit from and be blessed by what we call, and I am going to press home till you guys get it, the Corpus Christi. The Corpus Christi. So the body of Christ gifted sovereignly is to be in understood in terms of the uh, incarnation because it's the body of Christ. But the second thing that I want you to understand now as we get into our text is the term gifted. Gifted. Please understand that. Was Christ a charismatic? Yes. <clears throat> Was Christ a charismatic? <clears throat> He was the most charismatic man in the world. All right. So what I'm going to do now is demolish the prejudice we might have against the term charisma. Charismata. Because what we're dealing with right now is the charismata. Okay. And when I say, was Christ charismatic, I am simply saying, was he not filled with the spirit? Without measure. 
So, for those of you who understand theology, for John to state that Christ was filled with the Spirit without measure is another way to call him deity. There's no other human being could be filled with the Spirit without measure. We are finite creatures, incapable of capacitating the fullness of the Spirit of God, as did the Son. So the Son was the epitome, he was the echelon of a charismatic believer in the Father. Be able to tap into. So as we deal with 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 8 tonight, the body of Christ, the Corpus Christi, the incarnation doctrine is critical to our salvation. If Christ didn't come in the flesh, our sins have not been paid for, we're under a delusion. If the incarnation of the Son of God didn't triumph in terms of our redemption and salvation, we really don't have any union with God at all because our sins have still separated us from, from God. So that we would simply be talking kind of gobbledygook according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when we say that we believe on the Lord Jesus. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, we are yet in our sins and our faith is in vain, Right? So what we're really talking about does have a lot to do with who we are and what our destiny is as well. So when I say the body of Christ gifted, I am talking about not only Christ, but every believer. Is every believer gifted? Is every believer truly charismatic? Every believer is truly charismatic. You can't be saved if you're not gifted with the Spirit of God. Do you guys understand what I just said? It's very important for you to get this you know, on a lot of levels. So right now <clears throat> with our class, maybe one or two of you are apprehensive by that proposition. And that's because you are viewing yourself from the standpoint of your single memberedness and not from the totality of the body of which this text must press us into. It is true that all by ourselves, we are nothing. But when we understand ourselves as being part of the Corpus Christi, that changes the whole dynamic. Are you guys following what I'm saying? It's very important then that you guys track with me tonight, and I'm gonna make sure I open the floor for Q&A for us as we work through the first installment of our study, which I think is gonna be very important, very enlightening, enlightening for you on this matter of the gifts of the Spirit. Because we are really truly, when we're talking about the gifts of the Spirit, simply talking about Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory, okay? That's, that's all we're talking about. And, uh, and we want to be able to benefit, benefit from that fully. So the body of Christ gifted, the body of Christ bearing the same charismata as Christ did, Yeshua did, as Messiah did. But the last phrase that I use is a modifier. This is an adjective. And what is the word? Sovereignly. So charismatic, charismata is at the heart of it, but... Paul expresses a massive qualifier that is essential to our study, and that is the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. The only reason you and I are believers is because of the sovereignty of God. Because God purposed by decree from eternity to have a people for the praise of his glory, according to his grace, through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. You and I are a product of the sovereignty of God. Does that make some sense? What that also means then as we press into the study is that not only are you not your own, <clears throat> but God selected and chose you specifically to be part of the body of Christ in the manner in which he wanted and he has given you gifts that are specific to his own purpose to be Operate it in your life in order that the glory of God might be manifested through the corporate efforts and edification of the body. So you and I are believers by the sovereignty of God. We are charismatic by the sovereignty of God. And we are called to manifest the incarnation of the glorious triune God in the same way Christ did. All right. Uh, a little bit more crystal clear focus. So Paul opens up with a statement that he frequently does. It's in verse 1, part A. Now concerning spiritual gifts, do you see the little word gift there, you guys? That's not in the original. <clears throat> That's an italicized. 
there is not the same as in verse 4 and verse 9 and verse 31. There's no word in the Greek there. It literally is now as pertaining to spiritual things. Now as to pertaining to spiritual things. So remove the word gift for a moment because he doesn't want us to actually deal with the gifts. He wants us to deal with the character and nature of the spirit. He doesn't want us to deal with the gifts and they're not synonymous. The gifts proceed from the spirit, but the spirit and the gift are two different things, okay? He wants us to talk about spiritual things because that's what he has been having a problem with this church. Because uh, it's important for you, to, you guys to capture it. In Romans chapter 1, notice what it says in verse 13. Romans chapter 1, verse 13. Actually, no, don't go there. Just back up to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, I'll make it that quick because I do want to uh, economize my time tonight. A couple things that you might know, and you guys probably know this when you study your Bibles, that Paul frequently uses the term, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. Brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. What that means is Paul could look out over the landscape of the church and realize that people were either inadequately informed about the grace of God that's in their life or negligible to that very grace that was given to them. Inadequately informed or Either way, the outcome is ignorance. If I am inadequately informed, I'm ignorant. If I am negligible, that is, I, if I ignore studying and pressing into Christ at the level of my salvation, I'm going to be ignorant too. Why? Did we learn anything thus far tonight? Of course we did. So we're already being brought into a more pristine focus as to the nature of the body of Christ. This may help you in your walk, and in fact, that's what it's designed to do. And so what Paul says is, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. And here's how he uses that term in verse 1 of chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be what? How that our fathers passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And of chapter 10 is a warning, is it not, about the blessings that they had received under Moses. This is what I am calling the corpus Moses. Why? Because Moses had brought Israel out of Egypt under the instruction of now is they're crossing the Red Sea. And what is he calling the Red Sea? A baptism. So what's happening? They are moving from no people in Egypt into a new people in God under Moses. They're being brought from nothing to a relationship with Jehovah through God's law. The law of God. The same as being baptized into Moses. Do you guys see that? So now we have, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, an expression of the corpus Moses. God for the glory of God and the advancement of the people of God for them to get to the promised land of which they were negligible and disobedient. Isn't that what 1 Corinthians 10 is all about? Warning them about how they had departed from a call to holiness, to engaging in idolatry. Chapter 10, brethren, beware, least you who think you manifestation of God, you could imagine for a nation, still they didn't take the gospel seriously. Am I making some sense? <clears throat> when you and I think about national Israel and how God entered into their life, did he not enter in sovereignly? Did he not enter in charismatically? Did he not enter in redemptively? Did he not manifest the power and glory of the crucified Christ in their life? Did he not manifest the lamb slain from the foundation of the world as the exit strategy out of Egypt? Did they not hear the gospel? Did they not see the power of the gospel manifested in Christ through Jehovah? Absolutely. They, and, and this is why we argue with people who don't get the continuity of the gospel from Genesis to Revelation. We say it's always been the gospel. God's son as the mechanism to deliver us from Moses. Moses will kill you. It's always been the gospel. 
This is why the blood had to be on the doorpost, because though they were being, being brought up under the law, their only hope was the priesthood. Am I making some sense? This is why when Moses was sent by God, God allowed Aaron to go along with him to bear record to the ministry of the priesthood to keep those knuckleheads in order for them to make it to the promised land. God's holy, so we must obey his law, but we got a problem. We need a priesthood. That priesthood was and privileges of showing the people that their only escape was not obedience to Moses, but submission to the blood. It was the blood that allowed them to escape. The law helped them to understand God's holy, but the blood helped them to understand that God's merciful. So those two comprehend the gospel for us of which Israel was ignorant. And so I say that so as we work through chapter 12, you can see Paul's pastoral heart. When the pastor says, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant, he's asserting that there's So I want to press into what that is. He does not want them to be ignorant of the radical distinction between being led by the Spirit and tyrannically governed by demons. He wants them to understand that there is a radical difference between being led by the Spirit of God and being tyrannically by demons. Now this is begin, going to begin to make all kind of sense to you when you back up and think about the behavior of the Corinthians in Corinth and all of the stuff that Paul has been dealing with since chapter 1. Would the Spirit of God promote division in the body of Christ? Would the devil would the Spirit of God deny the essential nature of the gospel to the body of Christ? Sensuousness in sexual pornea among the body of Christ? No. Would the devil? Would the Spirit of God allow for believers to indulge in and engage in idolatry, open rank idolatry against the true and the living God? The answer is what? No. But would the devil? Would the Spirit of God then, as we're dealing with now, <clears throat> allow no. But would the devil? Now you have your context, brother. Can you even begin to see it in the opening verses? You have your context, don't you? Look at what he says. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brother, and our spiritual things, I would not have you to be ignorant. You know that you, were, you Gentiles were carried away by these dumb idols as even as you were what? Led. So look at verse 2. <clears throat> Paul now is borrowing from two sources as he constructs this proposition relative to what he said the church at Corinth was before they became Christians. They were Gentiles. Now, Gentiles is understood in terms of an ethnic disposition, such as those of us who are not Jews, but it's also understood in terms of a spiritual disposition. That is to say, when we are Gentiles in our mind, cut off from the commonwealth of God and not knowing the life of God. A Gentile is technically a spiritually dead person. You guys got that? This is what Paul is saying. He's saying two things. He's saying you are spiritually dead outside of Christ, but you are also dominated by the dark powers of a satanic world where demons control virtually every institution in the world and you are slaves to them. Listen to the language. Notice it. You Gentiles were carried away. See that phrase carried away? That's an Old Testament terminology that refers to when a king takes control over a country and then enslaves those who are now their prisoners and takes them captive. And what Paul is saying is when you and I were unsaved, we were controlled by those dark forces in a slavish fashion. 
They controlled our heart. They controlled our mind. They controlled our thoughts. They controlled our thinking. They controlled our ethic. They controlled our morals. They drove us into behaviors and patterns. And we were so deceived that we thought we were doing it all by ourselves. Is that true? That's how Jesus said it in John chapter 8. He says, whosoever is continually practicing sin is a slave of it. Because he understood the dark power behind it as an intelligentsia with a stratagem and a methodology by which the masses of the world are kept doing what darkness calls it to do. Am I making some sense? We were all part of that. We are all part of that. And yet, you know what he calls them? Dumb idols. Now, this is the contextual side of the first Corinthians uh, study. And that is in Corinth, idol worship was everywhere because Corinth like Ephesus was one of those, um, it was one of those servile towns where the Roman Empire had basically really poured in all of its presence in terms of Caesar worship and, and pagan worship and, and demonism and all sorts of things that go all the way back to the Greek culture that basically uh, transformed all of the Middle East and all of Asia and then all of Europe at that time under Alexander the Great. You guys know that 13, uh, 300 BC forward, he dominated the land, Hellenized it, and gave it over to polytheism and henotheism, uh, including worship of the king or the Caesar or the emperor, right? So the temples were all over Corinth, devoted to a false worship of a false god that basically amounted to two things. Watch this now. Drunken orgies and demonic mysticism. Drunken orgies and demonic mysticism. I lift that up to show you something. Helping us see. Rebuked the Corinthians for alleging that the spiritual gift of glossolalia is equivalent to the pagan tongue speakings that went on in the Delphi oracles and the temples that were dominant in Corinth and in Asia Minor so that the Christians were under the assumption that as long as that they were manifesting the same kind of babble and chaos and emotionalism and mysticism and confusion that they were used to when they were under Paul is doing is saying that between what you did in those pagan temples when those demons came upon you and caused you to start writhing and moving and shaking and babbling and wallowing on the ground and, and engaging in So what Paul is doing at the opening of his discourse around a beautiful truth that we're about to get into is say look I want you to get this now. The spirit of God is not sensual or chaotic. He is passionate. He is zealous. But he is not darkness nor sensuality. He never cuts the lights off. He always cuts them on. He always brings out not a lesser clarity of God. He never moves us away from a rational, cognitive understanding of who God is so that we're just moved by our emotions. Never. That is the hallmark of paganism. Are you with me, brother? That is the hallmark of paganism. That's why if you were saved and in those environments, if you were saved and in those environments, there was a part of you that could never, ever join in that stuff. If you were actually saved, if you were actually saved, if you were elect of God, he also kept you from the above. Being saved. This is the grace. Of that we fundamentally become reprobate. He never lets it happen to his elect. Are you guys hearing me? 
He never lets it, as bad as we may go deep into it. And some of us on even in the midst of it. Can I get a witness? It's true. It's true. We were dealing with the study and what fundamentally what I will say is that um, what he never lets us do is commit what Moses called presumptuous sin. High handed sin of open rebellion at the level of blasphemy against God. He doesn't let you do it. He can let you go low. But he will never let you deny that light that he has placed in you that's designed to lead you out. You guys got that? This is why Paul can say in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says, I was a blasphemer, I was a murderer, I was all this, forcing men and women. He didn't say blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, because you can blaspheme the Father, you can blaspheme the Son. He said, but he forced men and women to deny the gospel. He says, but I did it in what? No way. What are you saying, Pastor? There is a blessed ignorance that God leaves all of his elect in that does not allow them to cross over into an overt, volitional, hostile, demonic type of rebellion against God for which they become reprobate. Well, I'll leave it like that for you to think it through. I'll leave it like that. What does he do in verse 2? He says, you know that you were Gentiles carried away by these dumb idols, even as you were led. Now watch this. From this place, he's getting ready to get into a doctrinal issue that I want you guys to comprehend. He says, wherefore, I give you to understand, which is the same thing as to not be ignorant of, that no man speaking by the Spirit of God. Do you see it? Yeah. Watch this now. No man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed look at your first point the spirit of god does not dishonor the son the spirit of god does not dishonor the son you guys following me so far the spirit of god does not dishonor the son what comes out of men's mouth must be judged and even if they say the spirit told me to say it we must judge their words to Now, the only way you're going to know what they're saying is true or not is for you to know the way of the Spirit. That's why I got back to the whole point of sovereignty and making a distinction between the gifts and the person of the Spirit. If you don't know the person of the Spirit, you can attribute to the Spirit all kinds of highfalutin, crazy behavior. Am I making some sense? Here's what Paul says. The Spirit of God will never occupy a believer's life and move him in a direction of calling Jesus accursed. The believer will never curse Jesus. Do you guys hear what I just stated? He will never do that. He will never do that. That's the thing that the Spirit of God will keep you from. Now let's press into what it means to call him a curse because we're so very superficial in the 21st century, we're thinking about uh, uh, curse words. Is not to say are not a problem for the believer. Like this now. When we use curse words, whenever you do, in all likelihood, it's an evidence and manifestation that you are a child still. See, because children go goo goo ga ga and use stupid, unintelligible words when they're trying to get across a point, particularly when they are emotionally unstable, right? But grown people find words that are appropriate to the issue in order to set forth propositionally how they feel. Am I making some sense? So respond with words that are articulate and clear and grounded in biblical truth so that we express what we say and what we mean children right because they're acting like children when they're advocating and, and, and expecting people to accept that as something spiritual when nobody even knows what they're talking about. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 
So now stay with me now, because I'm getting ready to press into why Paul is starting off by letting us know. Whatever you want to attribute to the Spirit, you Corinthians, do not attribute to the Spirit any form of behavior that dishonors the Son. Because the Spirit of God cannot dishonor the Son. He cannot, not just that he will not, he cannot. It is not in his nature to do so. His very person, his personhood, the attributes that constitute his personhood cannot allow him to dishonor the son. What it means is whatever behavior dishonors the son can never be attributed to the spirit of God. Why? Because we've been taught by Jesus himself that when the spirit comes, the spirit of truth, he will take the things of mine and show it to you. He will not speak of himself. He will what? Glorify me. Will he glorify Christ? So watch this. The only thing the spirit of God can do according to his nature and his assignment is to glorify Christ. That's all he can do. He cannot dishonor Christ on any. He cannot distort Christ. He cannot deny Christ. And again, I'm pressing into this because I'm sharing from our other studies to help you and I know that one of the battles that's going on in our world is the diminishing of the son. And an assertion that you can get right with the father without the son. Do you guys hear what I'm saying? And therefore, if somehow one can think that they can have a, a relationship with the spirit of God, exclusive to the son then you have an antichrist doctrine and whatever that spirit is that may be operating in your life cannot be said to be the spirit of God. So now let's just go into the next. The spirit of God does not dishonor the son. Abuses of the charismatic corrected. That's what Paul is doing. He's, abuse, he's correcting the abuses of the charismatic, the gifts. That's what the word charismatic is. And it's used for the first time in verse 4. It's honoring the son by clarifying the nature and role of the spirit of God. Does that make sense? Watch this. So point B. The unbeliever is tyrannically led by demons. Did we already affirm that? That's 1 John chapter 4. It's a dichotomy between the believer and the world. We are of God, beloved. And the whole world lieth in the lap of the wicked one. That's 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. Pull that up, Ivory, as I quote it, so the guys can see it. And it's important for us to understand that John is actually dealing with the same fundamental doctrinal issues that Paul is dealing with, that James has dealt with, and that is a Gnostic notion that you can somehow denying the incarnation of the son with all of its attendant consequences too verse 20 we, we love him because he, no that's first john 5 19 sir first john 5 19 you got an outline up there oh that we are of god do you guys see that the we in the first person uh, plural there the apostle john is talking about the apostles that's one of the things he's doing in the book of first and We know that we are of God. He's first establishing the union between him and Christ that was given by virtue of him walking with Christ for three and a half years and Christ bestowing upon him the authority to be the foundation to the New Testament church. What that means is if you reject apostolic authority, then you have no authority upon which to stand. If you reject apostolic authority, you have a false gospel. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? Then he goes on to say, and not verse 20, is controlled by the wicked one. And what that means is the same that what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In our unsaved state, Satan controls the masses of the world through the mass intelligentsia in high places. And this is why, this is the reason for which when you talk to unsaved people, you know that they're under a massive
put them to a level, and then at a certain point, you hit a wall. Only God can penetrate that wall. And if you try the, the recognition that only God is sovereign to open up that door, which really is to compel you to pray for them when they're not in the state. Let's move to sub point C. Sub point C in our first uh, point, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Do you guys see that? Let me lift these two up. The Holy Spirit will not allow you. Holy Spirit is the grace by which you call him Lord. Right, because what we're about to talk about is, is the Corpus Christi relative to its mission. The mission of the church is the same mission that Christ had to bear record to his father, to testify to the righteousness of the one true and living God as being God's representative on earth, the God man, so that men either believe the gospel and live, reject the gospel and perish. That ought sets the world at odds against Christ and against the gospel. It is the way the body goes. So this is why I'm saying we have to actually take the opening verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 very seriously before we start playing around with the toys called the gifts. The notion of playing around with the toys called the gifts that Paul says he doesn't want us to be. Because here's how this would go. It would be like this. It would be like the Corinthians saying to Paul, Paul, just assume that we're all true believers. We're, we all been baptized. We all go to church. Now, some of us got some weird ideas and, you know, we got some weird problems. The gospel's even needed at all. And I mean, you know, yeah, we may. You are in trouble as a church. Am I making some sense? You are in trouble as a church. Because God is not the author of confusion. He's not going to descend upon us the kind of operation that's manifested among you as a body politic and call it what? It's very important. The follicle nature of verse 3 relative to our first point. Before we go into the beauties of point 2, because I just want you to appreciate once we go into the beauties, but point two, it's only after that we have come through that dark passage of polemic that Paul has to deal with. What is a polemic? It's the methodology by which you oppose something that's contrary to the truth with fury. You are exercising polemics. You are letting people know that you are seriously aware of having assessed the danger of what a person believes, letting them know you are wrong. You are in danger. That's why he says the spirit of God does not curse Jesus out. The spirit of God. man who hung on the cross for you was just a cursed thing that needs to be discarded. He went right on into 1 John chapter 4, and that is to say, the doctrine that was promulgated all over the place by the Jewish people is the reason that Jesus was crucified a crook, that he was an imposter, that he was not the real deal, and that's why he was crucified. And they would go right back to the law in Deuteronomy, which says what? Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. In, Africa, in Corinth, which began to happen among John, and especially all the Jews who were rejecting Jesus, the cross 
being the grounds upon which God saves you is ludicrous. And that man that's hanging on the cross is not your savior. He's accursed. You guys following me so far? Stay with me. Because that's exactly what is at issue with Judaism versus Christianity. Judaism does not deny that Jesus of Nazareth came into the world. It will not deny that he lived. It will not deny that he did good works. What it will deny is that the man hanging on that cross was the God man who bore the sins of his people in a proprietary way by which our sins is given to us. And they certainly do not believe that he rose again from the dead. Are you guys with me? So listen. When you hear the term, no man can by the denied the incarnation and denied the atonement. It denies the incarnation and it denies the atonement. It calls Jesus an imposter. This is why they're struggling with chapter 15, the doctrine of the what? Resurrection. Do you guys see how jacked up Corinth is? Corinth, first of all, the issue of the gospel in chapters 1, 2, and 3, which Paul lays out at length, was something that they were negotiating as not even being necessary. But what did Paul say? He says, for the Jew, the gospel is, 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 is ridiculous. For the Gentiles who seek wisdom. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.18, ministers who had come in with sophistry and smooth words were taking them away from the very grounds of their hope, which is in Christ. Now listen, listen, this is the problem. Put a, a message in the evangelical church today. You listen to five in a row, no Christ in it at all. No Christ in it at all. You listen to 10 in a row, no Christ in it at all. Why? Because they have lost the gospel. Right, listen to me, they have lost the gospel. And it's so bad that they don't know that they've lost the gospel. They're living under the in, you know, in our statements of faith, but it doesn't have to be preached. Right, well, this is the... Always goes the significance of the person and work of Christ. We are as soon as Christ is not the most glorious object in your mind, you're in danger. You're in danger. Here we are in the 12th chapter from the first. And Paul is dealing with some of these folks thinking that under the inspiration of the spirit, they could curse Christ. You see how the noetic effect of sin is working? That you can say under the spirit of God that they can say Jesus is a curse. Jesus is a curse. The man hanging on the cross, he's not our savior. He just was a, a Jewish imposter that came along calling himself Messiah. He's not the real deal. And is that not most? Isn't most of, a, most, most of your monotheistic Unitarian teaching today is that Jesus is not needed. He was a good man, but he certainly was not the savior of the world. And he certainly was not God manifest in the flesh. Am I making some sense? And they talk like they're Christian, just like you are until you press them on the issues of the gospel. As soon as you poke them, right. we don't believe the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. 
We don't believe in the Genesis narrative. We don't believe that God created the heavens and earth in six literal days and rested on the seventh day. We certainly don't believe that man was created out of the dust of the ground and God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. No way do we believe. We believe in evolution. We believe that Moses had a way with the people of God, but Moses was not infallibly given to write the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch or the Tanah. We don't believe that. That book is filled with errors. We believe that Jesus was born and that he was a good man, but a whole lot of what he was talking about in terms of death and resurrection and atonement and the miracles are, we don't believe none of that stuff. And we certainly don't believe the New Testament because the New Testament just locks us up to Christ alone or perish. So we just throw that out too. But they're Christian. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? But they're Christian. And what do they do? How do you be, how are you a Christian when you got so many holes in your Bible? Humanism. Human justice work together just as we are to make our world better. They don't even believe in eternal life. They don't believe in life after death. They certainly don't believe in the judgment of God on the last day. They don't believe in any of that stuff. You guys with me? They don't believe in any of that. And most of that is making its entrails into the hearts of professing Christians. The water goes in and drains out as soon as, it, as soon as it goes in. If you're not constantly being filled with the spirit of God through the word of God and being reminded of the gospel of the glory of God. Your, your intellect, your spirit is shaped by the truth of the word of God. You are constantly challenged with whether or not you believe those things. You guys hear what I'm saying? Do you see why you have to constantly be under the word of God? Constantly, to constantly be confronted with, I don't like to use the word confronted, but um, um, uh, imposed upon by the whole council of scripture. You see how we have to constantly be confronted with the that is? Because you and I, by nature, don't retain truth. We let truth go. Yeah, we let it go. If God is not constantly holding. This is why the Hebrew writer had this same problem. This is why he said in Hebrews chapter two, we ought to take. And that church that he wrote to let them slip. That's Hebrews chapter six. When he, where he spoke in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 3 and following, he says, if you have turned away from the word of God, having heard it, tasted of the good word of God, the, 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 the world to come, and, and have been a partaker of the Holy Ghost, and you, you have heard the message of the crucified Christ, to turn away from that message, the position of the Jews, kill him because he's not our Savior. Now you have moved back again under Corpus Moses. Because the only thing we have in the world is Corpus Moses and Corpus Christi. The only thing we have in the world is law and grace, works and faith. Once you go back to religion, you're back under works again. You guys see what I'm getting at? Yeah. All right, so let me press on. And I'm going to lay it out, and then we're going to come back and press into it a little bit more. I'll take some Q&A for you with you guys today. So under our first point, the Spirit of God does not dishonor the Son. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 42, verse... Um, <clears throat> 20, I believe it is, Isaiah 42, 21, says, And he shall magnify please for his servants. Verse 21. The Lord is well pleased. The Lord here is the Father. Is well pleased for his, his is the Son, righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. Is that what Christ did? Did he magnify God's law? Did he make it honorable? Right. Would the spirit then take that which the father was pleased with and distort it or deny it? Which now moves us into the operations of the three persons relative to the gifts. 
See, what, what Paul is about to teach us is the unity of the Godhead descending into the body politic. So as the unity of the Father... Did you guys hear what I just stated? Let's deal with this then. I'll just, I'll just touch on this and highlight certain aspects of verse, um, verses, and we'll come back next week and deal with the gifts. Look at uh, our second point. I call this second point the triunity of God doing what? Working the gifts. Do you guys see that in your outline? The triunity of God working the gifts. In the opening of our study, we were dealing with what the uh, purpose of of Christ, right? To make them an extension of Christ. So this is not just about the Holy Ghost kind of flying around like Santa Claus, dropping gifts off to people as you ask for it. This is not, not, you know, you don't, you know how in some right, so if a man helps you to find your spiritual gift, please understand the Holy Ghost didn't do it. Alright, because what we're going to work through now is uh Three persons relative to not only your spirituality, but your giftedness by the Spirit. And Paul is going to talk intentionally about the relationship of the three persons with regards to this whole working. To as a member of that body, it is the consequence of a And the three persons are always in agreement. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if they are in agreement, ought not we to be in agreement with them? So now watch this now. Here it is. Point number two. The triunity of God working the gift. Oneness, right? The three persons, that's triunity. Try what we are dealing with here. And we're going to see that expressed in the working of the gifts. And that's the second thing I want us to consider now before we shut it down. The working of Actually, well, no, I think that's in verses 4 through verse 7. Listen. Diversity of what? And there are differences of administration, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Do. Do you see him? And they are inverted for only one reason. They are inverted because the central subject is the work of the Spirit of God. Then the Son... He is called upon first. Am I making some sense? Now, as he is called upon, I want you to see the distinction between his role, the role of the second person, and the role of the first person. I want you to see the distinction, because Paul wants you to see the distinction. You get to contemplate the work of the third person as some kind of uh, rogue maverick free and unhinged from the Son and the Father, doing whatever he wants to do, because it's his time now. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? The Holy Ghost doesn't just get the clown and act the fool, because it's his time now. In other words, in churches. Did you hear what I just stated? Why? Because the implications are ontological they rise in 
unity of so what is said about the spirit in terms of his behavior would necessarily have to be said of the son because the three never operate disjointedly chaotically disharmonally or contradictory And the Holy Ghost, the Son, or the Father. All three function as, not in, as the Godhead. The role as they do individually. Are you guys hearing what I just stated? What the three persons do individually is always conflict between the Son and the Spirit. The Spirit will never ever function according to his own will. Neither the Son or the two against the Father. Because they are individual persons. We do not hold to the thing and kind of manifesting them. That's just, that's gobbledygook. That's insanity. God's not a transformer. So some of you getting ready to learn theology tonight. Three persons. Got it? Three persons. A little bit more. Whenever you think about God, think about God in terms of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Did you guys got that? Always think of them in terms of three persons, one divine being, one divine being. Share. The son and the spirit share the divine nature. Are you guys hearing me? And as such, they are one in purpose all the time because their nature by So now watch how Paul lays this out in our text in terms of how he's going to press home for us the function and working. That's why I have the word working here of the three person. Do you notice in verse four, universities of gifts. So the first thing that Paul calls your attention. To, we are at verse four. Now there are diversities of gifts and I want you to mark that first. It's in your outline, but for the sake of my brethren that are probably watching the thing that I want you to view now is that in relationship to the third person, who is who? Who is the third person? The Spirit of God. In relationship to the third person, his role and office is the diversification of the gifts communicated to every member of the body. job is to communicate the gifts described as that means communicate those gifts to the body are you about gifts in a personal way to every now there are diversities of gifts so what is so that the spirit is not over there? Verse five, and there are differences of what? Is that what your Bibles all say? 
administrations. Okay, so now what I want you to understand is that the second person, the third person being the spirit, the second person being who? The son. And he's called what here? Kyrios. Right? Is he called Kyrios? Is he called Kyrios? Look at the verse. see the father and the son in their offices both ontologically and in terms of how they function there will always be a distinction with the father When you use the term curios here, we are talking about. The only way you and I can be saved is to acknowledge. Faith comes by what? Hearing by what? How shall they call upon the preaching of the gospel? Whosoever shall call. This has to be revealed to you. The Father running every so that every, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is curious. Am I making some sense? So I'm going back to why in the opening of Paul's discourse, he could not tolerate the notion of the Corinthians thinking that somehow they could deny the Lordship of Christ. Because to confess Jesus as Lord is to take up your cross and be ready to die for that revelation. You're not just going around saying Jesus is the Lord. Jesus, that's religion. Jesus, the devils can say that. Did you hear what I just said? The devils can say Jesus is Lord. Believers say Jesus is Lord by the Lord. When they're by the Spirit of God. You and I believe unto the death. And they overcame him. So if this is true, and we have already seen it's in your body. Administrate them. Second person is administration. The role of the third person is communication. Can I keep going for a minute? The role of the third person is communication. The one that produced this is the administrator. He's called the Lord. His job is administration. Okay? He's the one that gives assignments in terms of where the gifts go. Because he's the Lord. Right? He runs, the, he runs the operation. His job is to administrate. See the word administrate in your Bible? It's the word for deacon. Diaconist. Okay? Diaconist. I'll get to you in a second. We'll get into the Q&A in a second. Administration is what Christ does. So you see the word administration. It's always the word service or office. Here it is. Or ministry. Ministry. It's the apostles. That receives a ministry has now been given a, an to execute certain things. Watch this now. Members of the gifts that come through the ministry. The Lord is the gifts unto men.
Ephesians chapter 4. So what I have said about the Holy Spirit is simply a humble position of being a servant to communicate. A humble position of being a servant to communicate. Of the gospel. That's his job. Like you can't know anything about the, the son apart from the Holy Ghost. Do you guys understand? to men the gifts that Christ gives to the church by which the gospel is communicated. Does that follow? Ephesians chapter 4. Show you something. Ephesians 4 actually lays out for us the order of chain of commands relative to the unity between the three persons and the church, the body by which the gifts are communicated and communicated effectively. I'm going to start at verse 1 and go all the way through verse uh, 11. Can I do that? Here it is. That you walk what? Worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. With all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering. Unity of the what? In the body of God, in the body of Christ. Between the three persons. Is to the three. He doesn't give us the responsibility to make unity. The unity is established between the three and and all. So watch what it says. You notice how it starts off with the spirit, right? But he's talking to the church, isn't he? Why? Because the spirit is always the immediate presence. Verse three, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body. What do we call that? Spirit, that's the immediate presence. And you are called in one hope of your calling. What do we call that? The gospel. You are called by the gospel. The gospel is the hope of glory into the body. Is that true? Lord, what's his name? Jesus. And then there's one what? Baptism. That's the baptism that Jesus commissioned his apostles to go into all the world with. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to observe whatsoever I've commanded you. Baptism. to their persons, and to their operations, to the incarnate body of Christ, the extension of who Jesus is. The Spirit of God in verse, in verse 5, and then we see the Father, one God and Father, your way. You see the parallel? You see how the spirit, the immediate presence is working with the body in the koinonia as a consequence of a submission to the second person, the Lord Jesus, who is the administrative authority over the church. But all of it is under the father. All of it is under the father. Do you guys see that? All of it is under the Father. Now I want to show you what Paul says in verse 6. is going to tie back to 1 Corinthians 12 verse 6. And then we'll be done for the night. This is where we have our monotheistic principle. He shares his nature with his son. Sharing his nature with his son and his spirit. In fact, you can't, you can't know him. But he... The father... Is always stay with me, John. Recovering now biblical manhood. I'm recovering biblical manhood right here. Is that true? I'm recovering biblical manhood. I heard my brother say it um, when the men were just.
God's your maker. You will be mystified, redefined, wrongly defined by somebody or yourself where you don't know. Alone tells you who you are. because I trusted that God would keep you away as we worked our way up. And we're there now, aren't we? By the way, and here's the reason why, they don't believe it anymore. Your relationship with your wives, if you ever become real men, It'll cost your it'll cost your relationship with women. Alitarian society that does not. It'll cost you. God. Did you hear what I just stated? It'll cost you women who don't know God. But if you take Jesus serious. To own him as your identity, the only woman that you can that, that will tolerate you is the gospel woman. That's the only woman that will tolerate you. I'm not talking this macho, woman beating, misogynist fool. That's not God's Imago Day. Those fools beat us up when we were distorted our relationship. That's a, that's a recovery process from a distorted, twisted, demonic uh, image of a man. But the biblical model of the God-man Jesus is from Genesis 1, 26 and 27. As true in the whole apparatus, this is why biblical manhood is a lithium of our life. All jacked up, and that means we need to go to the fun. And as we are called to be priests, we better go to the high priest because effectually to make us what we have. You're going to have to have Christ in your life. Who is above all and through all and what, gentlemen? In you all. So I want you to mark this because I'm getting ready to go back and then I'll close. We'll talk a little bit. There's one God, even the Father. The church. That's what we're talking about. He's the God of everything. Now watch this in verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the what? Gift of what? The gift of Christ. So now you know what, the, what Paul is doing? Having gone to the pinnacle of the Godhead, he's descending back down, describing illustration over everything. And that the gift as they are given to him by the Son. under inspiration of the Holy Ghost and he's not because of the what I said at the beginning of the message verses 8 through verse 10 is that true unto man is that the is that the judgment on the cross? Dispensation, funding of the Holy Ghost by which the gifts are given. The reason you and I are here is because of the descent and ascent. Incarnation. In reality, died, was buried, raised again, ascended on high. We're not even real. Here it is.
descended is the same that also ascended. Verse 11, and he, who is the he here? He gave some what? There it is. Who's the one doing the giving? Christ. You guys got that right. On the three persons, we have the church, the spirit, the son, the, the father, the son, the Holy Spirit, the church. Do you guys see that? Vertically up is all the way to the father. Mission takes place on two levels in the person of the son and in the Corpus Christi. On two levels in the person of the son. Next week, guess what we're going to be dealing with? To impart by the Spirit the gifts that are necessary to actually manifest the same. Am I making some sense? Less the work of atonement. That was exclusively his. But in terms of coming and loving God the Father, did he not love God the Father? Are we to love God the Father? In terms of living by the Spirit, did he live by the Spirit? Three persons are all so opposite. We're dealing with right now? John 17 is a massive argument for that point, is it? This is a request of the Spirit. Oh, my glory, that they might know my love, and thus I have given them the Because the third person, the way Christ was able to affirm everything that the Old Testament said was because the Father poured upon him the third person. The third person operated. This goes to show we need the third person. Yeah. Go with me back to our text. I'll come back here a little bit next week because I'm over time. I just want to deal with one more verse and then we're out of here. I want to share with you one more Except the fact that the Holy Spirit, UPS man, he's the driver. He, I drove for UPS. Our second elder, Angelo, drove for UPS. All the UPS driver does has been told to stop at and give out gifts. That's all he does. The UPS driver doesn't sit in the hub and put the gifts together and put them in the truck. That's administration. That's Christ. You guys got that? Our job is to deliver the gifts. That's what the Holy Ghost does. He, he looks, okay, this is Jessica saying, Lamont, boom. Boom. Calls you by his grace. Do himself and give What precedes him is the administrator. We just learned that. Who precedes him? Differences of what? Operations. Just call the father the operator. Here's another word for it. If you guys believe in Star Wars, you can call them the power base. You can call him the ground. the communication 
He drives the designation. He, dr he drives the edification. He is the energy that drives it. Are you? That drives the sun, that drives the spirit, that drives us. here is eternal union and communion between the father and the son and wouldn't that be the case for us is an evidence of the union by the reality that communicates the blessings of the Once question going twice. Put it for tonight. It's important to think through, right? Yeah. Right. So straight. Do you hear me? It's important to your keeping the gospel straight, and it shows you how. What God already knows is the perspicuity, that is, the clarity of his scriptures. They're teaching. So you and I are reading them, but they don't have the contours and the depths and the nuances that they should have until we slow down and just look at what. For the blessing of the body. Now next week we get to you guys understand that? And see how those nine gifts are employed for the aim of the church being able to preach and bear witness to Christ even in the face of suffering and of death. Ceased. Here's the way I'm going to put that question about things that cannot this massive foundation under it relative to the operation of the three persons now in humility and in reverence and in awe we can work through See how they operate relative to not only then, but now. Answering him. <laughs> and the reason why problem or complex but deficient answer that sets him up for trouble. Some answer with it because we want to be able to answer that question uh, yeah I, well, I walk eight hours of course you've been listening for years by the way he's a he's a brother that's been in our church for years he's just now getting weekends off taking a class on anything and what I mean by that is as I stated in the opening me vegetarian in nature and that John Calvin They view as wrong. 
So you know you. But they do really press into to knowing who you who understand the Bible are not Calvinist. Are not okay. so Calvin is just one of the major pillars that help establish and form you Knox know, at England, Calvin tons of great stuff that he did. Tons of great stuff. In fact, most all of our uh, evangelical church. Let, let me say that again. When you too, that means the Lord used you. That means the Lord used you. See, what I am saying is that we must see Jesus. Should we? Us. And should we not also expect people to love us? Absolutely. That's the best you can get. Some love and some hate. That's Calvin. People hate Luther. Oh, Luther wouldn't have the time of day if he met me in Germany in the year 15. Brother, me and Jews, because Luther had his cultural, but I love me some Luther. I'm not a Lutheran, but just because I love Luther and will quote Luther, that we isn't that metaphor awesome? Luther loved blue. You never forget somebody hitting you upside the head with that. Snow covered dog. What of the paradoxical nature of good? Luther got a ton of them like that. Now Calvin is dry, but that's how us how us French brothers are. We dwell in the lofty, you know, towers of intellectualism and and, and syllogisms and, and arguments that must be consistent and all that. So Calvin is great for that. Nature of the fruit of the spirit. The used him by the spirit, communicating to him by the administration of the son and by the power. Of the whole French world and passed on into Europe and has passed down. Yes, indeed. He did some heavy lifting. Other men have labored, and what we enter. In going to dishonor those brothers. We're just not going to live in the same house. Because God made me a black man. <laughs> Either in the culture. In heaven, we all cool. All things like Christ. Of an eclectic, diverse culture. I'm going to leave it like that. Let's stand for Anytime you want to talk to talk about our Baptist brothers, we can talk about them, our Anabaptist brothers. That a little leaven. They're to press home to them is got to be You still got too much. You leave that much dregs in there, y'all gonna get drugged. And our Baptist brethren will call in a derogatory fashion Anabaptist. Because they believe Christ afresh and come through the I understand what I just stated? And they said, from now on, it's not. If you can't show me from the Bible, 
and thus infant baptism and purgatory and a ton teaching nothing like that term trinity is not the argument all they were saying was if you can't teach it doctrinally oh, right doctrine. right the right that's what they, well that's what they meant they didn't mean the term trinity be very care, careful of what we call word fallacies these were theologians they understood that if you're going to be talking soteriology if you're going to be talking eschatology But your Bible is theology. Christ is soteriology. The return of Christ is eschatology. From a sound hermeneutic, the doctrine, both by precept and practice. Catholic Church end up being this monster. Because it steps outside of scripture and does whatever it wants to do. And now everybody is waiting on the Pope and the priesthood. To, you know, our churches are jacked up, but we're in a real good place compared to. Father, thank you for my brothers that have come out tonight. Thank you for this opportunity to get into your word. As we go on what we study uh, and, and uh, savor in our soul and then prepare us to worship you tomorrow. We yeah. Mr. Brown. Hey, young man. Yes, sir. And uh, just an observation, I, uh, the Spirit was bringing back a, a long study years ago and, uh, over the Do you hear me? It's important to your keeping the gospel straight. And it shows you how what God already knows is the perspicuity, that is the clarity of his scriptures. They're teaching. So you and I are reading them, but they don't have the contours and the depths and the nuances that they should have until we slow down and just look at what. For the blessing of the body. Now, next week we get to you guys understand that and see how those nine gifts are employed 
for the aim of the church being able to preach and bear witness to Christ even in the face of suffering and of death. Ceased. Here's the way I'm going to put that question. about things that cannot this massive foundation under it relative to the operation of the three persons now in humility and in reverence and in awe we can work through see how they operate relative to not only then but now answering him and the reason why problem or complex but deficient answer that sets him up for trouble. Some answer because we want to be able to answer that question uh, yeah I, well, I, of course you've been listening for years by the way he's a he's a brother that's been in our church for years he's just now getting weekends off taking a class on anything and what I mean by that is as I stated in the opening me vegetarian in nature and that John Calvin They view as wrong. So you know you but they do really press into to knowing who you who understand the Bible are not Calvinist. Are not So Calvin is just one of the major pillars that helped establish and form. You know, Knox had England, Calvin. Tons of great stuff that he did. Tons of great stuff. In fact, most all of our uh, evangelical churches. Let, let me say that again. When you too, that means the Lord used you. That means the Lord used you. See, what I am saying is that we must team Jesus. Should we? Yes. And should we not also expect people to love us? Absolutely. That's the best you can get. Some love and some hate. That's Calvin. People hate Luther. Oh, Luther wouldn't have the time of day if he met me in Germany in the year 15. My brother. Me and Jews. So Luther had his cultural. But I love me some Luther. I'm not a Lutheran. But just because I love Luther and will quote Luther, that we isn't that metaphor awesome? Luther loved blue. You never forget somebody hitting you upside the head with that snow covered dog. What of the paradoxical nature of good? Luther got a ton of them like that. 
Now, Calvin is dry, but that's how us, how us French brothers are. We dwell in the lofty, you know, towers of intellectualism and, and, and syllogisms and, and arguments that must be consistent and all that. So Calvin is great for the nature of the fruit of the Spirit. The him by the spirit communicating to him by the administration of the son and by the power the whole French world and passed on into Europe and has passed down yes indeed he did some heavy lifting other men have labored and what we enter in we're going to dishonor those brothers We just not gonna live in the same house. Cause God made me a black man. Or either in the culture. In heaven, we all cool. All things like Christ. Of an eclectic, diverse culture. So I'm gonna leave it like that. Let's stand for Anytime you want to talk to talk about our Baptist brothers, we can talk about them, our Anabaptist brothers. That a little leaven. They're to press home to them is got to be You still got too much. You leave that much dregs in there, y'all gonna get drugged. And our Baptist brethren will call in a derogatory fashion Anabaptist. Because they believe Christ afresh and come through the Y'all understand what I just stated? And they said, from now on, it's not. If you can't show me from the Bible, and thus infant baptism and purgatory and a ton of was teaching nothing like that. Term Trinity is not the argument. All they were saying was, if you can't teach it doctrinally, oh, oh, right, doctrinally. right, the right. That's what they, well, that's what they meant. They didn't mean the term Trinity. Yeah. Be very care careful of what we call word fallacies. These were theologians. They understood that if you're going to be talking soteriology, if you're going to be talking eschatology. But your Bible is theology. Christ is soteriology. The return of Christ is eschatology. From a sound hermeneutic, the doctrine, both by precept and practice. Catholic Church end up being this monster. Because it steps outside of Scripture and does whatever it wants to do. And now everybody is waiting on the Pope and the priesthood. To, you know, our churches are jacked up, but we're in a real good place compared to. Father, thank you for my brothers that have come out tonight. Thank you for this opportunity to get into your word. As we go on what we study uh, and, and uh, savor our soul and then prepare us to worship you tomorrow. We pray.